Um, short uh, agenda, what's uh, on, the, on the menu today. Um, I think I'm going to you know, give you a little introduction to Kanban because it's like uh, important to understand um, uh, what it is it and how you could you know, benefit of it. So, um, uh, so we uh, can you know, change to the dependency management uh, topics. Just a short, really, overview. Uh, and you know, uh, as an alternative to other approaches, I'm going to introduce the risk-managed uh, approach from uh, Kanban, and that's basically it. Um, if you have questions, go ahead, ask. Um, and that's it. Let's start. Uh, yeah, short copyright notice, not that important. Um, OK, meaning of Kanban. Who has the idea? What does it mean? The word, actually, the semantics, the word. You guys have an idea? All right. Anyone else? Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, so basically, Kanban in kanji and in Japanese have the meaning of something visual, visual sign or uh, big signal cards. And in, in Chinese, it means basically looking at the board. So um, kind of kind of fits that. And where does this stuff all come from? So this is a uh, Kanban storage area at Motomachi uh, um, plant. And what you see there is a guy. Uh, and these are actually the Kanbans, right? And as you can, maybe some of you know the Toyota production system, and uh, which is heavily about uh, pull mechanisms and flow in production. And if you want to know more about that, you, you know, look it up at uh, Machine That Changed the World famous book. Um, it's about Kanban in production, right? Uh, this is kind of the, the origins of what we are going to talk about today. And this is uh, when I'm talking about Kanban in, in knowledge work, I'm talking more or less about this, uh, these books here, and especially the theory of constraints. And uh, Donald Reinaldson, maybe some of you know them, um, flow in product development. And these are all the topics that inspired David Anderson to create or to use, at least starting from theory of constraints and then going to lunch with uh, Donald Reinerson, who pointed him, well, why wouldn't you use some Kanban uh, elements uh, to organize knowledge work and not only production work? So these are the, the, this is the background for Kanban in knowledge work. So for you just to remember, important uh, theory of constraints, just in time production and the supermarket principles um, where I think it's a rumor, but Taichi Ono is supposed to go to a supermarket in the US. And he was wondering, uh, well, people you know, pull stuff from the shelves, and someone replenishes the shelf. And he had the idea, oh, wow, that would be cool if I can apply that to production. Potentially, it's a rumor. I'm not sure about that. But uh, at least the uh, principle of supermarkets is kind of key element to um, Kanban systems. And let's uh, look behind how that might work. Uh, imagine you have a process or a workflow step A, and then you have a B and C, and then you kind of have a production workflow. Uh, could be also applied to any knowledge work. And what they introduced here is a buffer. You know, because usually, if you have someone producing, I don't know, spoons, right, um, the production flow would go directly to B without any further information. So what they did in Japan that uh, I think it would be a wise idea to have some sort of a buffer, a storage area, such that B and C would not uh, get the material uh, from the upstream process, but would pull the material from the buffer. And A would produce, not directly to B or to C, A would replenish the buffer. You know. So we put something in between. So what's missing? What do we need for that? That's not yet a pull system. What is a key element here? We need a Kanban. What is a Kanban? It's a signal. So we need a signal for replenishing, right? So if you have a production flow from left to right, you have a signal. So the Kanban signal moves from right to left. 
because otherwise A would not know when to replenish and how much of the staff, which staff, where does it go. So all, these, uh, all this information is usually on the Kanban board. So this is how you implement a pool system. Right? You create a buffer and you limit the buffer to the capacity of, in that case, how much can B process or how much can C process to avoid overproduction, to avoid uh, useless inventory. And this is also important to know that production work is different to knowledge work. What can you see in production? Wait, knowledge the chair arms, the chair legs, the chair back, exactly. The chair <laughs> Lots of inventory, right? They take up the space. What you cannot see in knowledge work. It's all in Jira, right? You can scroll away, hide it, go, you know, close the outlook. You have lots of work you usually don't see, right? And that's the challenge. So there are more differences and similarities from uh, Kanban from production and knowledge work. <coughs> but the important part is that the Kanban systems uh, usually consists of a quantity, and these are the Kanbans, right? Uh, so the signal cards that circulate in a process, right? And uh, thereby you control access to a scarce resource. That also applies to knowledge work, right? If you have a scarce resource like a business analysis, a PO, a testing guy, or some other service providing people, um, um, that's important to understand. It's basically the same, right? So what are pull systems, pull signals, right? We need those pull signals in order to implement uh, a Kanban system. Pull signals really uh, indicate at uh, which point in your process or workflow uh, is there any capacity, right? And um, if you know that, you can pull work in this, in this workflow step. And also, as we've seen before, the pull signal uh, propagates from right to left and work usually flows, at least in the Western world, from left to right. So let's have a look. Where's the pull signal? Uh, imagine if that was your your uh, Kanban system or workflow system, you'll be working here. Where's the virtual Kanban? The virtual Kanban, you don't see it. That's a virtual signal, but you can uh, calculate it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we have a uh, buffer limit size here of three, and currently you have two work items in this um, uh, activity. So you have a virtual Kanban signal, and now you can actually start pulling work in. For that, you pull work in, and your capacity signal moves from right to left. Right? So in that case, you have now capacity in development. So now development can actually start producing stuff because otherwise they would produce like in, produce inventory um, which is potentially uh, overburdening the the downstream process so development pulls in other work and the signal propagates to analysis and now the analysis can pull in work and finally the signal arrives at the commitment point and this is where you in Kanban do something like um, ad hoc prioritization right you pull in stuff when you have capacity. Now you make a decision, what's urgent, what's important, um, what should we start next, right? And then you pull stuff in. This is the basics behind a delivery system, which is uh, using Kanban or pull systems. But that's not it, right? That's only producing, producing stuff. Um, and I guess so, for you product people, it's like, okay, output is not necessarily outcome, right? So how, how can we deal with that? So we have something that's called Discovery Kanban. And you see this is all left of the producing delivery Kanban system. What, what you do there is actually you filter and develop options. You know, mar mar markets are uncertain, the, uh, uncertain, the environment is uncertain. So you need to take time and <coughs> you have lots of ideas. I'm sorry. Um, you do some elaboration, approvals potentially, and then something is ready. In that stage of a process, it's totally okay to discard a lot of things. Uh, and I'm pretty much sure you practiced that <laughs> a lot in the last three days here. Um, 
But however, if work arrives here at the commitment point, and then you have again this buffer, as you have seen in the ABC example, um, then you deliver committed work and you work on that, right? What you don't want to have is something like that. Right? When work arrives as your delivery process, um, and this is potentially your constraint, you don't want to pull work uh, and you don't want to have um, a high avoid or discard rate in delivery. Here's okay. Why? Here you can test, you can use lean starter, whatever method you like to have, test your ideas, develop them, put them in production, and finally, if it's here, someone will say, okay, that was a good idea or not, right? And this is important, uh, particularly when the future is uncertain, the priorities change, right, and um, you have a high discard rate. So you want also to move this point uh, as far as possible because you don't want to commit to stuff which is uh, highly uncertain, right? I guess you've seen that, right? What could that be? Right, backlog, correct. So here you have smaller items, right? more sophisticated um, elaboration, less uncertainty, and as you go down in your list, you, you, know, you get to the ideas and stuff like that. So what, what, you know, what can you do now? You flip it 90 degrees and you smash a Kanban system on top of it. And then you have something like a managed uh, discovery process where you can actually concentrate on, on um, using your capacity wisely Usually what you do here is something like a minimum, not a maximum, because you don't want those guys to starve of work, right? If that's your delivery process and this is your constraint, they should have enough valuable work. So you have the opportunity to manage the whole process through a Kanban, um, to discovery Kanban, such that you can expedite the most valuable and urgent stuff, prepare them, make them ready, and then these things are going to be pulled into a Kanban system. And just to give you a glimpse, who knows, I guess everyone knows Optimizely, right? Uh, these are little pop-ups that appear on your, on your website, I think, as a service, and then you can provide feedback um, and interact maybe with a bot, maybe with a human being, I don't know how it's like nowadays. And this is actually an end-to-end -end Optimizely um, product development process. This is uh, from their office. And you know, this is like all the discovery, the idea generation uh, thing. I think there's a bulb somewhere here. And you see what everything, what they are doing is on this wall. I think it's like 15 meters or something, right? And this is a delivery process. And I think they, dependent on who is talking to whom, you can see like groups standing here or here or over there. So this is like an, one example how you could um, map out your whole product development um, uh, process uh, using uh, an upstream and downstream Kanban systems. All right, but what is this Kanban thing, right, as a method? Um, so some myth busting uh, before, what's not? So Kanban as a method does not replace any software engineering process, right? It doesn't tell you how to develop software. It doesn't tell you if you do test-driven development, if you, you know, uh, the continuous integration or anything like that. It doesn't matter yet. Uh, you can still manage that. So that's a not, not a software development process. And it's also not replacing any project or product management uh, um, methodology. So if you think uh, it's wise to use a business canvas or produce a business um, plan in what way you think it's appropriate, you can do that. And far and not least, it's not a process, it's not a framework, right? So that's a management method. And what, if that was a product, what, what would that be good for, right? First of all, directly improving the service delivery, let's say. Whatever you're doing, uh, you can apply Kanban to improve your delivery, uh, uh, your delivery process from the customer's perspective. To catalyze also improvements and by the end of the day, evolve your business uh, to be fitter for purpose for, from a customer's perspective, right? What is, are you implementing the right product? Are you, so is the, pr the product idea valuable? Are you implementing it right? So we have also always the pizza example. If you order a pizza, is it a good pizza, right? Is it 
baked well, is it you know tasty, and <laughs> was the delivery good? So if you ordered it and they told you they will deliver it in uh, 30 minutes, but it took them an hour and it's cold and not tasty anymore, you probably won't be happy, right? So there are three components you want to manage. Let's look shortly at, um, at the architecture. Um, so the method consists of your change principles and service delivery principles. And you know, in order to get going, you need some practices, you know, how to do it, actually. And of course, there are some values behind it, but I'm not going to deep dive into here. So one of the most important change management principles is start with where you are. Right? This might be a little bit different to other agile uh, approaches, but this is like the key point with Kanban, whatever you're doing right now, be it Scrum, be it Safe, be it you know, we don't care. Start whatever you're doing now and understand what you're currently doing and respect roles and responsibilities. However, that means not stop where you are because it would be otherwise pointless, right? Um, so gain agreement to pursue improvements in an evolutionary, evolutionary fashion. Right? That's like a key element. And last but not least, um, encourage acts of leadership at all levels. If the boss is not here, if the product owner not here, we are not going to have a daily or anything like that. It's usually not acceptable and will not provide you the results you, you know, seek to, to gain. So in sum, it's an evolutionary approach. We have applied to your current way of working. Um, so you get the improvements over time. But how? You know, what to do? And the general practices tell you actually uh, what to do. First of all, we have visualize, limit work in progress, so you actually uh, get to a real pool system because without limiting, that is going to be hard, right? Uh, and by that, you manage flow, and managing flow means how is work propagating through our system? Is it you know, an even flow? Do you have overburdening on, you know, of the POs? Do you have to analyze the staff and prepare the user stories, and the development guys are kind of, you know, have nothing to do, or how is it going? Is it um, a smooth flow? And make policies explicit means every decision or, um, that can be taken by a team or by, by the product people, that would be good if everyone would you know, see all the information that, that is required to make a good business decision. And this is about make policies explicit. And evolutionary change, I guess, um, without feedback loops, that would be really hard, right? So that, you know, am I going the right direction? So you need lots of feedback loops. Um, last but not least, um, we need experiments if we want to progress in evolutionary fashion. So this is why you need improve collaboratively and evolve through experiments. But if you run experiments uh, using Kanban, safe to fail experiments, right? So I guess you heard that already here too. If you want to drill a hole in your boat, don't do that under the water line, right? <laughs> because that would uh, sink you probably. These are the practices, okay. And uh, we have another three uh, important elements. These are the service delivery principles. And this is sort of customer orientation, right? So the assumption behind that, and this is already kind of a hint to dependency management, that your organization is a network of interdependent services. Right? And in order to you know, get that well, you need to understand and focus on your customer needs right? and expectations. So is it the right product? Is it implemented well? Is it delivered in time? And you manage the work, not the workers. They should be self-organizing around the work. So you have a, a Kanban meeting on the Kanban board. You discuss the work. <laughs> You don't point to people, right? The work is important. Is the work flowing? Not if is, the question would be not if everyone is busy, right? So we don't do resource efficiency. We do flow efficiency. This is important. And if that's not yet the way you are, you way customers expect, you regularly review your network and change the policies and regulations such that you improve, right? And the values behind that is customer focused respect. What does it mean respect? If the team says, we are already at capacity, you should not be pushing more work into it, right? So, and understanding. All right, what is a service in that sense? Well, basically, really general, someone has a need. 
it's a customer, it's your customer. It should be an internal or external, and they will ask you for a product or service, right? That's a need. What you do then, you react to that, and that's the whole service delivery part with all kinds of activities. It depends, you know, what you're doing. Um, and ha happily after, you know, hopefully, when you're done, the customer will say, great, great job, right? Uh, this is what I ordered, it tastes very well, and it was delivered in time. And the customer is the only one who can, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down. No analyst, no consultant, no one else. <laughs> it's the customer. Um, I will jump over that. And that actually brings us to the challenge we want to shortly discuss today. So challenging uh, challenges within the professional services business. Uh, and why we care about dependencies. If I guess if you look all at your all, all yourselves, you guys work with your head, right? That's uh, knowledge work. And usually uh, professional services, we create intangible goods. Right? Sometimes it's a product, you can actually touch it, right? It's maybe a box, but usually it's not that easy, right? So, uh, and you guys probably work also in an ecosystem of all kinds of different services. Marketing, design, engineering, testing, deployment, HR, and all kinds of um, elements within an organization that re are required, you know, that from a customer's perspective, you have an end-to-end -end flow. So dependencies arise, right, within an organization. And usually dependencies, when they arise, are indicators there, there's some interaction between different services, right? And in that sense, service delivery requires collaboration across organizational boundaries. Otherwise, you won't be able to deliver to the customer because maybe something is missing. And I give you a real example. That was a work summer workshop at the bank in, in Hamburg. And the group was supposed to, uh, well, define what your service is and please create a map of, you know, if you want to deliver the service, who else is involved? So here in the middle, you see this tiny little guy called customer. <laughs> and this service will create an account uh, within this bank. So that to do that, they need kinds of salespeople. They need customer care, authorization, marketing, product management. They need a platform. Um, there's a thing called production in banking. I'm not sure what that is. But IT, consulting, controlling. So there's a lot of people involved just to create an account in that bank. That's not one of the famous and fastest banks, I have to agree, but, you know. Um, so uh, you see here, if I go ahead and say, well, that's the IT. Make those guys faster. Make them agile. What do you think uh, the customer will perceive? How large would that impact be? <laughs> yeah, ne ne probably not that much, right? Because it's, um, I like this, do I have this statement from uh, Dr. Eckhoff? Probably some guys know of you. Systemic thinking. Um, so the performance of the whole uh, thing here is not the performance or the sum of the performance of individual items, but the interactions, right? So the, from a customer perspective, the thing is going to be only as good as the interactions between all the items are. And this is also the key to dependency management. If you want, uh, so managing dependencies from a customer perspective, you want to achieve smooth flow across the whole organization. Uh, this is kind of the key thing because um, you are not just one team or one part of the organization um, who is involved in, um, in the whole end-to-end -end performance, right? So that's a scary thing, right? Uh, and then you ask your question like, oh, what should we start next? Do we have the capacity to deliver it? And you know, when we deliver it, will it be in time? But then you add the dependencies, and if you start delaying something today, you don't even know if you have capacity, you know, three months later. Can you be sure about that? Probably not. And, you know, what's your rip? How many parallel activities in your organization can you run and not sacrifice performance? And how will dependencies affect your, um, your ability to deliver from a customer perspective? So this is the reason why we actually care about development, uh, dependencies. And the nasty effect of dependencies is, so imagine you order something from Amazon and they usually deliver within one to three days, right? That will be awesome. But then you order something which has a dependency to some maybe sub, sub, sub contract, 
company from Amazon, right? Sometimes that happens. And this happens. You get a delay. And the delay can be multiple times what you're usually delivering. Right? And this is what is called the fat tail of this uh, lead time distribution. If anything, what did, uh, happens because of the delays, you usually wait and wait and wait some more because uh, delays have an impact on your lead time. And the risk in that case is always in the fat tail. If you're a customer and you order something uh, from an organization and you happen to meet on delays, you will probably land somewhere in the right end of this distribution. So you get your stuff really late, right? Because usually managing dependency is not easy. So we are all scared about that. Oh, hell, what to do, right? And there are also approaches like get everyone in the same place for two days and then bring smiles of string and then start analyzing dependencies. So a couple of weeks ago, I was in a conference and met a guy who was consulting a large German auto uh, organization. And they were flying it. They were flying in people, 1,200 people from all over the world every month to a huge, I don't know, football stadium in Hannover to do something like analysis and planning. So that can do it, but you know, 1,200 people every month, that yeah, you should have, you better should have a large account <laughs> full of money. All right, that's, that's quite expensive. So we have the usual suspects. How can we approach that managing dependencies? So traditional one, plan everything out, right? Upfront, deterministic approach. Uh, big plan of fraud, be completely deterministic about your dependencies. Figure out where you have dependencies, start fixing them, planning, and so on and so forth. But then the, you know, the VUCA thing hits them from the back and now it's all getting nasty and difficult to replan and change management. So it's time consuming, expensive, and also unreliable if you, have a, if you are in an environment where change is basically normal. So then we have the reorganization approach. So basically you try to restructure in order to remove dependencies. You try to put people in, in one team, in one part of the organization where you try to remove dependencies. And that's all good. Uh, however, you cannot scale it indefinitely, right? It's becoming, from time to time, becomes difficult. The more teams you have, you will eventually have some dependencies somewhere, right? Uh, and also, if you have a dynamic, highly dynamic environment, your demand changes, and Isabel can tell you probably about stuff that changes from time to time, and you have many teams, you cannot be certain that your configuration in, inside your organization with, that you have today will fit in the next three months or maybe 12 months. So you, you can you know, keep up the reorg um, with the changing market. Um, that's kind of challenging. And then we have the hybrid approach that's basically a combination of the two. You increase your, your batch size, you increase your time box, and uh, it's also expensive. And this is the example of uh, flying in 1,200 people someplace and do planning and bring a lots of string, right? Uh, and it's kind of jeopardizing agility if you increase the time box and the batch size, and then you, know, you try to commit to a three, three month batch. Uh, it uh, has its disadvantages. And the third one, is, uh, this is the fourth one, is more like from a technical perspective. You try to design out um, dependencies within your architecture. But, well, is that a practical advice? I don't know. If you have legacy systems, it's kind of hard. If you start with something and it's small, it's maybe possible. But over time, you probably need a lot of effort and highly skilled people to keep this uh, clean and running. All right, so let's look at the alternative for the else committee, risk, kind of risk managed approach. And there are three ingredients for that. First of all, you need to determine your urgency, the urgency of the stuff you do. And usually, so what, what you need for that is that's supposed to be something customer recognizable item, right? The customer would look at that and say, well, I wanna have that in you know, that time frame." Or we have kind of risk. So you guys know GDPR stuff? Was it this year? No, last year? I don't remember. Yeah. Last year. That's a good example. Something is not urgent, not urgent, then bam, <laughs> really urgent, yeah. right? You better plan ahead. So you need to determine the urgency and the risk associated with your product feature, your item. Um, 
And the second step is, okay, if you have this urgency, you should assign the risk class to that, and the risk class determines how you pull it in your development process or into your whatever process, and how, you, how this work item propagates through the whole system, because just selecting it is not enough. So if you assign a risk class to that, it should be treated as something special. Do you have an idea of other kind of risk classes? If, who is flying from time to time? Yeah. And then it became super low again, but it became like a company OKR, and then it had to cascade into OKRs of every single team. All right. That was horrible. <laughs> and if you think of flying, can you imagine, you know, being pulled specially and treated specially on a plane? Upgrade to business class and first class and so on. Usually you start already with getting on a plane in a different way. So they pull you in first, you get served first, you get treated totally different in a system called plane. And this is a good example of um, classes of service, which are next topic. But I owe you one third step here, um, reserve capacity. So if you can determine what, you know, how urgent is your item, your feature or your product, and you assign a specific class to that, and dependent on how risky that is, you should be able to reserve some capacity in advance if it's really risky. If not, you don't have to, right? So let's, I, I need to show you a few basics that are required for that thing to, to work. So what you need for that is some sort of market payoff value achieved, right? What, what are you trying to achieve with your feature or product? Uh, how does that relate to time? Or how does this thing relate? develop over time. And then you need to determine, okay, if I know that, somehow maybe it's also risk and more qualitative and less quantitative. What does it mean if I delay it? What does it really mean if you delay uh, something, your fixes before the GDPR date hits in? Is there uh, a fee or is there, you know, what, what happens to you economically as a company? If you have that, then you can decide what's urgency. And uh, the urgency is basically the, um, you know, how, how bad is it going to be if you delay it by one week, by two weeks, by three months, right? Um, and that is, you know, really important in order to make a proper prioritization decision, right? You know what you want to achieve, you know what happens if you delay it, and then you assign the risk class to that. So let us look. Imagine you have a marketing campaign, right? You want to start it... Uh, uh, if that is not available by January the 10th, you have some cost of delay, you know, delay cost function. And that you lose money, basically, in that area. The later you deliver the thing. This is when you want, it. You want to, to have it on the January the 10th, right? And then you have an assessment of how fast is your marketing department capable of delivering marketing campaigns, for instance, right? Um, and usually they are pretty capable. Um, between like, what do we have here? Like 20 and what is it? I don't give it a reason. 60 days is the most of the marketing campaigns ready. However, there is also this fat tail. Some marketing campaigns take time and this is your zone of danger, you know? If you hit this zone, you will lose money because, well, now in a couple of weeks is Christmas. Imagine you want to run your campaign before Christmas. Um, running the campaign after Christmas doesn't make sense, right? So you want to hit it spot on. And if you have that, so you know your capability, right? And you know when you need it, you can make an informed decision when to start. And the risk of incurring some delay is basically what are the chances that our marketing department will deliver that not to the particular date we need it. And this is the information you need to make such a uh, informed decision, right? For that, you use classes of service in Kanban. And classes of service, as you guys just uh, discussed, are something you know, related to how you pick an item um, from your you know, priority queue and how you treat it in the system. So basically, you use classes of service to do prioritization, right? 
And these are just the uh, standard four archetypes based on cost of delay. We have like a standard, you could call it, ah, that would be nice if we already had it, but we don't. Um, then we have fixed state. This is a great example of GDPR. You usually have a fixed state or some legal uh, changes or you know your database uh, Oracle update or whatsoever. And then you have the expedite. Um, I call them Rende Meerschweinchen, burning guinea pigs because then everybody knows you know, your database is down or you cannot access something, so really high risk um, event. And my favorites are here. So this is like refactoring and doing all the stuff you actually, it's important, but it's not urgent. But the problem with those things is they become uh, more urgent really, really, and then become expedite. So they hunt, haunt you down eventually if you don't pay attention, right? So this is like the basic idea of um, classes of services. And another thing we need for that is the definition of calling and called service. Imagine you are in a product development and then you, supply, you need some legal advice, right? You would be the calling service and you call actually your legal advisor and ask, well, this is my feature idea. We had that a lot at Lotto24, right? So before they eventually launch something new, they need some legal advice and approval to launch it. So you have a dependency, right? Uh, before you finish that work and launch it, you call this guy or this department or service and say, well, we need this uh, re legal review and please prepare it up front. So just for you to, have, to keep in mind, we need two things, the calling and the cold service. Two important things in a Kanban system. And the second one is reservation systems. So let me explain. So imagine that would be your uh, sprint delivery rate. It could be in user stories. It could be in actually counting items. So this would be your capability. And your minimum would be, I think that's like eight items per week. And on average, you have uh, 20 items per week. And you have a maximum here. This is like 30 something per week. And you can use that to reserve capacity. So, but when you reserve capacity, you should never exceed the average because that's not that likely. And you've been, if you plan with that, you might get into, get into trouble because you have reserved capacity you actually don't have. Um, what is good enough, you could, uh, you could also use like the minimum. This is what kind of guaranteed class of service, all right? This is a minimum reserved is your, your minimum plus a little bit until the average. And everything is above is you cannot commit to that, and you shouldn't. And in Kanban systems, you can look at dependency management from the perspective of the calling service. That would be you. Uh, and the call service, let's keep at the example of the, with the legal uh, department. If you determine the item you're working on is you know, not that urgent, so you can do just-in-time discovery. You don't know if you have this uh, dependency or not. Uh, you can use class one, and this is basically let it be, right? We just start with that in, in enough in time, and the likelihood of slipping is not that high. So what I did today for tra traveling to Berlin, uh, I was kind of late, <laughs> so it was not almost that. I arrived in time at the um, Ham Ham um, Hamburg Hauptbahnhof uh, or Dammtor. Oops, I'm sorry. And <clears throat> it turned out my train was five minutes late, and then my train was 10 minutes late, and then my train was 18 minutes late. So there was a delay. Why? Because the train, so the Deutsche Bahn, had the dependencies f for ho whoever was preparing and delivering the train in Hamburg Altona. So those guys were late. But luckily, I booked my, uh, my, my train f ahead enough so I could arrive here in time. So this is like, I am sure that's not that urgent. I book enough, uh, early enough, so I you know, deliver it in time. However, if uh, you have a highly risk of cost of delay, you want potentially to do something like that. You will include dependency discovery in your definition of ready. You would not call something ready if you are not sure if you have a dependency or not, right? And then you can use, okay, class three or four even, that means if you know there's a dependency, you better negotiate with the cold service that they have capacity for you for the time you need it. 
If that's not enough, you book a guaranteed reservation. Uh, you book a slot. For you guys, if you work in iterations or sprint, you say, okay, in the sprint f five weeks from now, if you had like one, one week sprints, I need this ticket. I need this done. So you book in advance uh, and use the reservation system. And then those last but not least, like no margin of, for error. You want to know you have a dependency and you will not start implementing anything unless you're not, you are not sure that you are going to be able to deliver it. And those guys you are dependent on should guarantee the delivery too. So if I had like a plane flight from Berlin, I would really book everything I can so I can arrive in time. So let's, let's shortly have a look how it looks like in Kanban systems. So this is class one, right? You have a particular capability of delivering whatever you're doing, and you actually don't care, right? You know it's good enough. Uh, there's not, uh, not a lot of urgency or there's not a lot of cost, uh, um, cost of delay. So you just pull in work, you fix it, and if a dependency occurs, you know, those guys who are working for you will figure it out and deliver it back, right? So that's no, no, no large risk. However, class two, if you want to mitigate the risk uh, of um, delivering too late and you're not sure if those guys will have the capacity, the first thing you can do is um, do some capacity allocation. Imagine you were working here and you need support from the second team here and you would um, allocate capacity of, let's call it like six items uh, on, those, on this service. Why? You don't want to overburden them. You don't want that this service becomes unpredictable because if you do not limit the amount of work they start, they will become eventually unpredictable because they will probably have a lot of work and work items will bypass other work items and that you know, will make them really hard to predict. So you want to reduce the amount of work those guys can start that fits their capacity. That's your first thing you can do. If that's not enough, you go to three and you create a reservation system. This is like an additional one. So I'm going to need this item in week 28. And this item is of size two user stories, for instance, right? So you book some capacity in advance. And of course you do some dependency analysis. That that could go in into your analysis phase that, um, you know, including in the definition of ready. So you have an item and it's really critical to deliver it. You want to make sure if there are any dependencies, you discover them up front. So you become a little bit more deterministic. Right? Um, and if you have that, you rather book capacity here because you will really want to make sure you get this in time. If that's not enough, um, you create your own reservation system because you also want to be sure if I start it, I'd rather have the capacity to do it. And you take the reserved class booking. So you look at your minimum delivery capability and say, well, six items per week, for instance, and then you reserve enough capacity in your own system because you really want to make sure you are capable of delivering it. And you reserve the guaranteed class booking at the dependent service because you do not want to risk any delay. And five, that's like no margin of error. That's everything deterministic upfront planned. Why? Because there is a high risk of incurring cost of delay for a work item. Uh, running of business, running completely out of business. If I think of Lotto 24, right? If they don't have, uh, don't get any approval in time and you're not capable of fixing that, they will just run out of business, right? That is an item of that sort. So the thing is here is there is no black and white, like no dependency at all, or like doing everything deterministically. There's a whole bunch of things you can do in between. Right. It depends on how urgent your items are and what risks you have. And then you can use different classes of service um, to manage that risk. So sometimes there's necessity to be deterministic. Sometimes there's no sense in planning up front, right? That's kind of the message. Here. Okay, what else have I brought to you? What happens if you have multiple teams? 
there's a thing called capacity tokens, right? That's basically like the puristic Kanban implementation. Imagine you have a user story or a feature that requires support from ABC. <coughs> it could be Teams, it could be uh, you know, other services, what you can do there. Would you start? So you have a guarantee that one team has capacity, it's team C. Probably not. Would you start then? No. If you don't have all three capacity tokens, you do not start because you don't know if you can finish. There is no guarantee they have capacity. And if they are doing, if those guys are doing Kanban or Scrum, it's not that important. You just need to figure out what it means for you. Is it uh, story points? Is it items? Is it, you know, what does it mean the capacity? So in that sense, if you have dependency on multiple teams, for instance, um, you can uh, use a reservation system and capacity tokens because the only thing you can actually control is when you start something. Don't be delusional and think you can control when you finish something, especially when you have uh, lots of dependencies. And it's easier to manage when to start something than to manage when to finish something. That's a lot harder, right? And for all of that, you kind of need feedback loops, otherwise it won't work, right? Imagine you have, so these are the Kanban cadences, you have marketing, you have design, you have HR, and they all need to work together, right? To you know, really create end-to-end -end delivery. You use something like operations review where you discuss how I, you know, what do you need from me? What do I need from you? How is it working out? Is it good enough? Is it you know, fast enough? Is it predictable? Let's discuss how we can uh, you know, all align around our work so we can basically deliver uh, to customer expectations. Thank you. <laughs> I was in time. Now, well, just a few things about me. Uh, I'm sometimes the guinea pig of David Anderson. Uh, he puts me on stage just to put stress on me. People come and ask me nasty questions. So I'm an APT and an APC. So I'm a Kanban trainer and a Kanban consultant. Uh, and this is our little uh, company from Hamburg, the Flow. Uh, that's my wife. Um, and we provide Kanban training, project product management. I met, uh, yesterday I tried to Google out if what, uh, what kind of uh, session you had in 2012 here in uh, Hamburg, uh, in Berlin, but manage agile. Uh, well, something about complexity, I couldn't download the material anymore. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Stefan and I was since 2012, we've done, I think that's my fifth, sixth field I don't remember. I think I've done them twice at least as a participant. Um, and from time to time I visit uh, you guys. So thank you very much for inviting me today. And, uh, and thank you for coming. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. If you have any questions, we have an hour for 10 minutes right, for discussion if you still have any energy. <laughs> um, yeah. So, questions for us.